So just before Jesus departed, his disciples came to him and they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Tell me all your thoughts on God. So it's interesting to note that even though um, Jesus had risen from the dead and instructed his disciples in many ways about the kingdom of God and talked about this in eternal kingdom coming, they were still in fact expecting and desiring to see a kingdom restored to Israel. They still believed that Jesus was meant to be the king of the Jews and to establish a kingdom on earth. So that's why they questioned him about this. And it's interesting to note that Jesus did not refute or deny the idea of a kingdom based in Israel. But his following words he went on to say was that, um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he was instructing them to carry on with this message, and to continue out into the ends of the earth, and as you read the story through the book of Acts, you realize that it did in fact take them a while to realize that their mission was to continue out beyond the Jews, out into the Gentiles, to the Greeks, to the other parts of um, the Roman Empire, and even beyond that. So it took quite a while and they eventually started to catch on to this idea of taking the kingdom and proclaiming it to all men, all nations, all people everywhere. And so um, the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them that task to bring a kingdom, a kingdom that's not based on what we call ethnos, but is based on the ethos of, of turning spiritually to God rather than just a kingdom based on a particular racial group, the Jewish people. So Jesus was preparing them for that and they were learning to see that mission and, and develop that mission. Jesus mentioned at one point in Matthew 13, 51, 52, when he was talking about the parables with his disciples and they were questioning him and he explained some things to them. And then he says, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out, of, brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. So he's painting a picture here of Old Testament um, teachings and what was laid down as a foundation previously. And then he talks about new things coming out, a new treasure coming out. And this would be a way we could describe the New Testament teachings and how we go from an established um, rule of God having a relationship with one nation to God wanting to reach out and create a relationship with all nations and reconcile all men who should come into his family and into this new kingdom that's being developed. And that is another reason why Jesus described his disciples that he chose from outside the regular um, group of people um, to be described as a new wine. It's a new priesthood. It's a new leadership that he's developing. And so he trains up these guys who seem to be outsiders, trains them up for something new. In the new covenant, there's a new testament, there's a new proclamation, and the kingdom of God has now been extended out into all nations and all people groups. So it's a really exciting time, but it takes a, a while for this to start to come to fruition and for them to get their heads around it, because all of his um, disciples, apostles, were all Jewish initially. So there's some kind of a duality going on here. And this is what can be really confusing to understand. And throughout time, it seems like there's been this duality and this kind of tension between one versus the other. And um, in some ways during the church age, during our time, people have, for a large part, in order to proclaim the, the gospel and to take this into all the world, people have, for a large part, forsaken the Jewish people, the um, kingdom of Israel because they were no longer a nation for so many years it seemed like that was gone it was all over and that God was now just simply creating a kingdom that was amongst 
all of the nations on earth and the Jewish people no longer were relevant in that picture. And so um, we get into this idea of, well, what is God's plan? What is his timeline? Um, and if you consider that there are prophecies going all the way back, talking about the promises to Abraham, the promises to Israel, and the fact that they were looking for a Messiah who would be a, a king on earth, who would operate out of Jerusalem, then where are we at? So there's a whole bunch of terms that, that come to mind to explain some of this duality and, and to explain the time period and the plan that God has and it kind of demystify it if we can understand some of these things. So I want to introduce you to these ideas of um, these terms. So the age to come in Mark 10, 30 and Luke 18, 30. Jesus uses pretty much the same term here or it describes the same discussion. And Jesus says, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life? So he's talking about a, a future age, a future time. And we can speculate about whether that age is a physical earthly age or, or is he describing the eternal state as an age to come? Um, you would tend to think that ages were time periods in the earth. And just to consider what are ages and what are these time periods, according to the biblical understanding, the biblical model or the Jewish um, thinking in Judaism. Then there's other terms that have come out and some of these may be unfamiliar to you. and You may wonder where they come from, but I can unpack some of that. So we've got um, what's described as redemptive week. Then there's terms like the last days, the last day, and then the idea of a Sabbath. So if you tie that in with a redemptive week, um, there's a Sabbath or a rest day. And so now um, to sort of bring some of that together, I'll, I'll show you this verse from um, 2 Peter 3, 8, where Peter talks about this idea of days and time from God's perspective. And he says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise to some, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So Peter's talking about this idea that to God, time is very different. And what seems slow to us is actually perfectly fine in terms of what God wants to do. Um, but he alludes to this idea of a thousand years is as one day. And to, to the Lord, that's how he looks at things. Now, this is something where we think he's just describing time. But when we look back and we discover now looking at um, the ancient patriarchs, the Dead Sea Scroll language, it seems it's, it's something that um, Jews during the Second Temple period there um, anciently would recognize as being a description of something they're familiar with, that God has a plan for the earth and it revolves around a, a period of ages a period of time and that in actual fact his model always works around the seven day or you know weekly cycle that you know we have a seven day week and this is actually all based on the same idea god created over a period of seven days or six days plus one rest day and then throughout time we use this cycle to describe things there are seven year cycles. There are jubilee cycles, which are seven times seven. They're 49 year cycles, but they're all made up of groups of seven. Um, in the Jewish tradition, they have weddings, which are seven days. So there's so many uses of the seven as a model. And these guys in ancient times seem to understand or believe um, the terms that were passed down to them that God was working on a cycle that worked on this time period of, of each day being as a thousand years. 
and somewhere in the range of that time you'll find his um, plan for things being outworked. Now it's uh, been talked about that when you look at um, the coming of Jesus being in Malachi, I think it's Malachi 4, 5, it says the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And the word used in that scripture is actually the word sun, as in the sun in the sky, the planet, um, the star, the sun, um, rather than the son of God. But it's describing the son of God as rising like the sun. So the term sun there denoted to people who were paying attention to these things as signs, as in Genesis 1, it talks about the, the sun and the moon and the stars shall be for times and seasons. And they believed that the Messiah would come on the on what would be the fourth day of creation. The sun was created on the fourth day along with the planets. And that the fourth day in these terms would be 4,000 years from creation. So they had a way of calculating on their calendar where they were at from creation and the time periods. And you can look back and calculate through the genealogies and through genetics today and find this pattern where Jesus was born at a time that they would say was 4,000 years and rose from the dead at that time. So somewhere 4,000 years from creation, Jesus Christ was on the earth. He was crucified and he rose from the dead. So that gives you four days of 1,000 years. And then the time period that we're in now is we're looking for a completion of two more days, which would be another 2,000 years. So as you can see on our AD calendar, we're somewhere around 2,000 years from Christ or from his birth or from his death. Um, somewhere in there is a time period that matches this um, days, weeks, of a thousand year cycle so and peter is saying that you know it may take that period of time but god has a plan and so don't be discouraged but when the time does come the appointed time comes it'll be sudden like a thief and things will change very suddenly so there are people who are looking for these things to happen so so this is where we come to the idea of last days if we had former times, we had 4,000 years and then we had another two more days to fulfill before we get to the final Sabbath, to the final rest period of time, then we're looking at last days. So Jesus uses this term in um, John 6. He actually mentions this, this line, this statement, four times throughout John 6. So this is from verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me. That I, should not that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus is using the term the last day for when he will raise up um, people, he will raise up those who were faithful, then Philippians um, 2.16, there's another term here where um, Paul references and says, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So he's saying for those who are faithful and, and keep these words, um, hold fast to the end, that I will see you and I'll be proud, I'll be able to celebrate with you together on the day of Christ. So he's referencing a day. Is it a just a single 24-hour day? Is we talking about an age, a time period referred to as the day of Christ? Um, ref, you know, alluding to what we call the day of the Lord. So I want you to have a look at this. I'm going to pop up here a just a little simple chart that just shows you this kind of idea of um, God's redemptive week. So you've got this time period of 4,000 years from creation, you've got Christ um, coming to the earth, um, being crucified, and then resurrecting from the dead, and then ascending and saying that he's going away, he's going to send you the Holy Spirit, and I want you to proclaim this good news. And the interesting thing here is if you look at this, you go, well, we've had 
approximately 2,000 years um, that were laid out for Abraham and his offspring to establish a nation that would be essentially were meant to be different, unique, a light to the world. And they were to honor God and walk with God as an example of how God wanted to relate. He gave them a word, um, scriptures like the scriptures they record are prophetically God speaking to mankind, speaking to them, but also he's providing a message to mankind about who he is, how he wants to relate and, you know, describing his character and, and giving a model of a covenant relationship, a relationship where there's an agreement between both parties to participate, to honor one another and to bring prosperity and peace through that covenant being upheld. So it's often described in scripture as a, a relationship like a marriage because a marriage is, is a covenantal relationship. Um, and between God and man, there's this covenantal relationship that's established with the nation of Israel for 2,000 years. And then it's interesting to note that from Christ onwards, we see another 2,000 year period of God establishing a new covenant. And now the gospel can go into all all of the world to all nations and he wants to perpetuate this covenantal relationship and welcome other nations to come in and join in this new family that God's created. So it shouldn't be too surprising to actually see this pattern and God in his patience of wanting to welcome all of these people he's allowed 2,000 years for the gospel to be preached into all the world. And he's waiting patiently for that job to be done. And it's taken many years to raise up the missionaries. It's taken many years for to overcome the language barrier. Initially, they had the Holy Spirit. They were able to overcome the language barrier and preach in different languages. But throughout the years, we've translated scriptures into other languages. People have gone out and discovered people groups and languages, learned to speak their language, learned to translate, and found ways to get the scripture, the message, the good news of the kingdom to these people so that they could be included, they could be welcomed because God wants to bring together a family that's got every tribe, nation, tongue included in it. So it's not surprising that in his patience, he is allowing that to happen. He's causing that to happen through these people. But his end goal is that there's going to be a period of time when Jesus can come back and welcome all these people into the family he wants to establish a kingdom of righteousness because Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace, but also as the King of Righteousness, as representative of God. And Jesus did say during his time on the earth that he wanted to bring fire. He wanted to bring a cleansing to make all things right and to establish a righteous kingdom and essentially to end a rebellion where men just forsook God and did whatever they wanted. Um, so it's a fearful thing um, for those people who do not recognize and honor God and, and choose wickedness rather than this relationship and, and this relationship where knowing that God has your best in mind um, when he gives you these directions and, and instructions and, and help and that he actually puts his spirit in men to write these laws in their hearts so they know instinctively what to do. So this is the plan that God has. It's very exciting because, and it's and he's so, so patient and waiting for all of us to join in and gather with him. So then if we want to consider the Sabbath rest idea, it's interesting to note how it's described in Hebrews, which is quite likely written by Paul back to the Hebrews, um, talking about how God's plan works. And he says here in Hebrews 4, 3, 4, Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So Paul's just simply, or the writer's just simply saying that God established a pattern by taking a rest day. And right from the beginning he had this plan, and so he laid out this model of how he wanted to operate through creating this weekly pattern. God could have created the world just like that all at once. But he actually laid it out in order over a six-day time period and then had a rest day when in actual fact 
he didn't need to rest, but I believe he rested from creating. And everything that's gone on has basically followed the scientific process of, you know, of physics and biology and those things, you know, plants and animals replicating after the kinds using the genetic code that's in them. And everything else, the other physical properties of, of the planets and the stars and our Earth um, rotating and traveling as they are and the gravitational forces and everything else are operating according to the mathematics and science that was established right at the beginning. So God's laid all these things in place and that's why I believe we can look back and use science to understand the process of how these things came to be and, and we need to unravel and discover them and that's why originally there were so many scientists who believed in creation, believed in God and wanted to investigate and understand everything that he's created and how it works. And we today can do the same. We can look at that scientifically and see that in fact these things do make sense. We can use genetic science, we can use archaeology, we can use paleontology, and we can use all of these different things to understand um, the mysteries. We even use science to understand the age and um, authenticity of documents that we have, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and the other scriptures that we refer to, and we can compare these things. Um, we can use archaeology to tell, you know, the dates and the times and the processes that match, say, you know, when the Israelites entered into the land and they took over Jericho. We can find archaeological evidence to show that that happened and the time that it happened and how that time period matches. So God is certainly on schedule and on time. And we can now verify that these things are true. So if we want to come back full circle to this duality, so we've got a kingdom that's going out into the, all of the world. We're welcoming people of every tribe, nation, and tongue to be part of the kingdom of God. But then what about Israel? We come back to this duality. Has God forsaken Israel? What's the relevance of Israel? Was it just a template or an idea that's now been forsaken? Um, do we come back to that? Um, so sometimes people talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And I've heard discussions about this where people will say that during Jesus' ministry, he changed his tone. And when the Jews rejected his message, he started preaching a different kingdom and proclaiming something different. I'm not sure that that's entirely correct. I know that in the book of Matthew, Matthew himself uses the language of the kingdom of heaven repeatedly more so. And it's really only once in Mark that they use the term kingdom of heaven. And so some will say that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things. The kingdom of God is like the um, ethos the spiritual kingdom and the kingdom of heaven incidentally is the earthly kingdom the kingdom of israel and so i don't fully agree with that idea but i think there are two parts to that which is interesting to note that just like there's an earthly um, jerusalem and a mountain mount moriah where jerusalem and the temple mount are placed there's also a spiritual place a mount zion in scripture that talks about God being on his mountain and that God's always described as being in elevated positions. And so God is described as sitting on Mount Zion and Mount Zion is more a description of a spiritual place than it is the physical place. So yes, Jerusalem and Mount Zion may be synonymous with one another, but one describes more of a spiritual position and the other one describes a physical position, a physical location. They may be caught up entirely with one another, but within two different rounds, these things can operate. And I think this is really what's going on with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all of those people who have submitted and recognized God is the king of all creation. That Jesus Christ is the king of all the earth. He's the king of kings. He's earned the right to be the king of kings. He's earned the right to be the one who passes judgment on who is righteous and unrighteous. He has the ability to accept anyone who believes in him and count them as righteous within his kingdom. And when Jesus is on earth, 
he's physically king or he can come back and be physically king but in heaven he represents God's kingdom which is a heavenly kingdom where if you were to now be able to see into the spiritual realm as spirits do angels and demons see things you'd be able to see who is part of the kingdom of God and who is not you'd be able to see those that are glorified and those who are not so there's an element there where I believe there's evidence, you know, where angels recognize, and you'll see in the scripture where angels recognize those who are part of the kingdom of God. Paul and Peter, John, those types of people, the demonic spirits, angels knew exactly who they were. And then people who are not part of the kingdom of God, people who are part of the kingdom of darkness, are recognized quite differently. And so in the spiritual realm, there are things that can be seen that are not apparent in our world. In our world, you can meet someone and see somebody and have no idea initially what kingdom they're of. You may not be able to discern whether someone is a true believer in Christ, whether someone is part of the kingdom of God, or whether someone is part of the kingdom of darkness. You can really only determine through the gift of discernment, but also the um, just the recognition. Sometimes you can feel a coldness or a fear or an unsettled, untrusting sense if you meet someone who is truly of the kingdom of darkness. And likewise, you can meet someone who is a believer who just exudes love and, you know, care, just has a sense about them where you feel good around them, you feel like they've got the best things in mind, um, people who, who are able to do and say things which are almost miraculous because they carry the spirit of God and it becomes apparent when you get to know them that they must be in a relationship with God that gives them something to offer that's beyond the natural, beyond the normal. And likewise, those people who can be very scary when you see the fruit of, of their life, um, when they're not operating by the spirit of God, but by some other spirit that has evil intentions you know, there's certain people you meet where you you sense that more than others. Um, but for the most part, we can't see anything in this realm. So a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly realm, a spiritual realm, and then an earthly realm. And so they're not really a dichotomy. They are just two different flip sides to what we see and what we don't see. But I believe that the promises that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Israel are real earthly promises and that he wants to fulfill them. So in terms of Israel being revived and God had an appointed time for Christ to return and actually set up a kingdom that's based out of Israel, based out of Jerusalem, then we can refer to verses such as this in Hosea. And this is a verse that's um, often referred to as Hosea's two-day prophecy. So in Hosea 6.2, it says, After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. So in this chapter, it's describing Israel as being like a disciplined child, like children who have been disciplined, and they've been struck, they've been disciplined. It uses the word struck um, in the King James, and it says, you know, he who struck us will also heal us. He will revive us. So he's saying after two days, he's going to revive us. So they've been through a period of time where they've been disciplined, and God is eventually going to open their eyes and show them. And, it's, and as Paul describes in the book of Romans, that the Jewish people have been blinded, and primarily so that the gospel can go, to all of the other nations so that this that these guys will scatter through all the world share the gospel because they're meant to be the light of the world and so the jewish believers have gone out into all of the world to preach the gospel and at some point the rest of um, the jewish people the rest of israel will eventually see and believe in the messiah and they will this kingdom will finally come and it'll be reconciled together so this is you know, where we describe there's two days and then there's a third day when they're raised up and that Jerusalem will be established. Christ will be there as a righteous king. And in Joel 3, 1 to 3, it talks about a similar thing and it talks about a judging of the nations and a making right of everything and that God uses Israel 
um, you know, his relationship with them as an, as an important symbol and a sign um, that we need to recognize. So it says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So that's a valley, what we call the Kidron Valley, right next to the east gate of um, Jerusalem, the temple area. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people. So he's talking about a judgment time. So part of his judgment, you'll see in the end, is that he's going to judge people according to whether or not they recognize Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as the way of salvation, the Redeemer. And he also will judge the nations according to whether or not they've mistreated Israel. Um, you know, people who are involved with the Holocaust, people who have spoken against Israel, people who have um, yeah, just mistreated this nation on account because the enemy... Um, Satan and that you know rebellious group of angels, spirits, they all want to work against Israel, just like they work, want to work against you in your own life and preventing you from finding the Messiah and following him. They want to prevent you from knowing God and loving God. They want to discredit his character. And likewise, they want to do the same with Israel. They want to discredit God's plan for Israel, discredit God's work there. They want to discredit the future hope for that place, for that nation. They just want to discredit and, in fact, overthrow and take over that because they want to rule the nations. They want to have your soul. They want to have the nations. They want to rule the world. They want to essentially steal your birthright that was given to man through Adam. They want to take that over. They want to have their kingdom. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to challenge them cast them down, and he is going to set up an eternal kingdom. And you can read about that final plan in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It gives you a vision of the final four kingdoms and how Christ, the Son of Man, comes and basically just takes that kingdom off those ones, takes the kingdoms of the world and makes them his own. He reconciles those kingdoms back into the authority of God, the rule of God as king, but also sets up a kingdom where we have a man on earth who is trustworthy to rule those kings, and that's where Jesus Christ does come back as king. So just wrapping this up, we just roll back right around back to Matthew twenty four fourteen. The gospel of the kingdom. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So the final time will come. Once the good news of the kingdom is being proclaimed to the whole world. So right now we're in the midst of this time. Or we're coming to the end of this time. In fact, if we consider that our 2000 years, our, our final two days are coming to a close. That this gospel may well have actually been preached to every nation, to every tribe and every tongue. There's been evidence recently to say that we may be at the point where that job has been completed. And what do you know? Here we are 2,000 years later looking for a time that fits, you know, that 6,000 years period of time. So 2,000 years from Christ. Um, this debate about the exact date that Jesus was crucified. Um, a lot of scholars, a lot of um, historians believe it was 30 AD or 32 AD. There's a bit of debate around that. There's a debate about, and we believe that Jesus was actually born in 4 BC and that he was crucified somewhere 30 to 32 AD, which means that if you add 2,000 years onto that, we're getting very close to a time which is 2,000 years later. One of the issues with that, determining that time, is that Jesus said no one will know the day or the hour. No one could be sure of when he should be expected, only the season. But also, um, there's ancient prophecies that say that the calendars will be messed with. And, and when you look into history, you discover that the calendars have been messed up. We've got a Gregorian calendar. The Jews have got a, um, a lunar calendar that they use, and that's out of sync. You know, we have leap years. They have leap months in their calendars. Um, 
and some people say that we're in was it a five seven eight three other people say that we're in five was it five nine four seven you know in terms of years from creation so no one can really agree on what the date is on the calendar but jesus didn't say that we could tell from the calendar he said look for the times and the seasons you should be able to discern the times and the seasons but if you're truly in relationship with God and walking with him, trusting in him, all you need to know is that your salvation is secure if you believe in the Messiah, you believe that he will come and rescue you. And I suggest we all need to pray for discernment to know the difference between the kingdom of God and the will and intentions of the people who are truly walking by the Holy Spirit, following our Heavenly Father, and those who are of this earth who are trying to establish and build up a kingdom which wants nothing to do with God and people who put their trust in the things of the earth, people who put their trust in physical things rather than in God. We need to put our trust in God. We need to trust in him. We need to trust that the king of the kingdom is interceding. Jesus Christ is apparently in heaven interceding for us, praying for us, wanting the best for us. If we put our trust in him, we can't go wrong. But we have to put our faith in something that's not seen. We're not concerned about a physical kingdom ourselves. We're looking for a resurrection that Jesus has promised that at, a, at an appointed time he will call and there will be a resurrection. And those who were alive at that time will not be resurrected. But the scripture says that they will be changed and caught up and meet together. And so the spiritual authority will change in the world. The spiritual authority in the kingdom of heaven will change. And the rule of man will be overthrown by the rule of Christ our King. That's what we're looking for. That's what we desire is for a righteous King. We desire justice. We desire those who are willing to submit and love God will be honored, will be blessed. And those who who, who operate treacherously in the world will be judged. Justice will come and that will be overthrown. We'll be no longer captives or slaves to that unrighteous rule, that wicked rule. And so we look forward to that. And that's really why I wanted to talk about the kingdom of God and explain it because I want people to know, you know about this duality, to know, yeah, that God hasn't forsaken the earthly world but there is certainly a spiritual kingdom and there's a spiritual kingdom where God is the ultimate authority. Jesus said when we pray, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe in heaven there is a, an authority where all of the spiritual beings, angels, demons, everybody knows who God is. They know that there's a supreme creator who is above all there is a God above all other gods. And that if you could see in the spiritual realm right now, you'd realize that there is a God who is far greater than anything else that wants to call itself God. And unlike on earth, it's absolutely apparent in heaven who has the final say and the final authority. And that's who we want to recognize and submit to. So God bless you. Thank you for listening. And I hope you keep tuning in. And um, if you want to like and subscribe, then um, by all means, you'll get more content. And, and I'd appreciate your feedback and thoughts because we all want to grow and understand this better together. We want to be able to walk with the Lord by his spirit, understanding these things as best we can. And um, I believe that's something where all of us can share together and build one another up, encourage one another and edify one another to know and understand these things really well. So God bless you. Have a great day.